side. Well, apparently I'm asking questions. Sorry, I was a bit uh, <laughs> unaware this was the case. Okay, so first question is, how are current energy constraints impacting on business strategies for mines in the regions? Who would like to have a go at that? Perhaps Peter from Western Power. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, uh, Minister, as well, for your presentation. Uh, I'd just like to say three things on that, if I can, just quickly. Uh, interconnected, uh, we would totally agree with the uh, interconnected future. Um, and we very much a believer that uh, incorporating renewables into that is uh, very important. Um, but in the, one of the big ones there was synchronous generation. GE have proven that a battery uh, can provide all the elements of a traditional power plant. So that, that debate, I think, is run and done now. So um, constraints. Yes, uh, it is a bit of an odd system that we live in. We call it unconstrained, but it does, uh, as um, the minister pointed out, it leads to uh, constraints, um, particularly in Kalgoorlie. Um, we have a 220 kilovolt uh, line out to Kalgoorlie. What does that sort of translate into? Roughly 155 megawatts. Uh, of transfer load every day. To build a bigger line, a 330 kV line, would conservatively cost about 1.2 billion. You'd really have to have a load the size of Las Vegas out there to justify that. So it's all about, at the moment, um, trying to utilise better that line. And this is where renewables, I think, are absolutely in the sweet spot um, for us. So without boring you, just quickly, um, of that 155 megawatts, about half of it is used on any day. So about half of it's sitting there available for use. But the old game in town was, and I don't blame the miners for doing this, it was very hard to get power from Western Power. We, um, it was hard to get a connection. It was a, took a long time. So you put your foot on the hose and you kept a contracted amount that you might think you might need that you realistically don't use. So we're going through a process now of, if you like, like an airline, we're overselling the seats and we're assuming that, you know, people don't turn up on those half of 50% of days. When they do turn up on uh, the occasional day when they need it and we'll have to turn down those contingent loads, we're calling them, the spillover loads, that's where renewables, we really, really think uh, as a backup source of power, they can actually free up capacity. So for us, there's a real opportunity there. I sort of addressed it. No. Um, okay, I, I might go in a completely different direction for a moment, but uh, with with mining companies in mind, which is, uh, I guess, where we inter interact with miners at the moment, primarily through Energy Made Clean, our our microgrid subsidiary. Um, we're building we're building a number of microgrids at the moment, uh, generally for. Um, non-miners, so Department of Defence, we're doing a couple for at the moment. And, um, and what we're seeing is that uh, those projects are happening at the moment because the, the premium that, say, the Department of Defence will put on, uh, on reliability and continuity of operations, uh, whereas the conversations we've been having with mining companies the last couple of years typically have, uh, we've got close to uh, maybe getting a deal over the line, and then generally speaking, it's been uh, just a final question of cost. I think we've seen payback periods a couple of years ago and even the last year being seven to ten years and now looking more like five to seven years and that's coming down. So I think I'm really optimistic in the next 12 months. We're, I think we've seen it today, in fact, with Goldfields announcing a, uh, a solar battery microgrid with, with gas as well. We're going to see more and more of that. I guess the point that I uh, think is worth making is that at the moment, we're getting some projects up, and Arena have had a, have played a really important role in sort of bridging some gap. But there's a bit of a perverse situation happening at the moment where we've got Arena subsidising some of these projects to get up at the same time that the federal government is also subsidising the burn of diesel on these sites as well. Um, and I know that um, you know when we talk to miners, their cost, absent the, the remote power diesel subsidy, might be 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, as soon as you get your diesel subsidy, it drops to about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's, that's probably the only thing at the moment making a whole bunch of mine sites and their investment decisions for renewable-based microgrids. That's making the difference, is the fact that we continue to subsidise burning diesel in remote locations. To me, it just seems crazy and it would be a really obvious way to save the taxpayer a dollar 
and to dramatically increase the amount of uh, renewable-based microgrids that get taken up. Now, Mike, I think that's uh, the point that you made um, about the, uh, the payback period is very significant because, one, in the work that we've done, one of the big problems out in the gold fields is that most, you know, we're not talking about large iron ore mines, uh, and uh, miners uh, have traditionally been reluctant to uh, put a uh, to do a take or pay or um, a power purchase agreement uh, for longer than seven years, even though many of them end up, in fact, operating for many more than um, seven years. But and that has been one of the critical points. But you're saying now that because you can get a payback period within a seven year time frame, uh, that that is making this now more doable. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's one big driver and that, that will drive the uptake of these. And uh, you know, full disclaimer, I'm a, I'm a graduate of the School of Mines, so I, um, I, I, know, and, you know, a lot, I know a lot of these guys that are trying to do the maths on this at the moment for their companies. Um, and it really is close now. Uh, and in some cases, some cases it's beyond that, particularly where you know, for larger companies, it's been easier to have greater foresight around uh, length of mine. Um, but again, I'd make the point for a lot of a lot of the, the smaller sites that are off grid, they'd be commercial today if if not for the um, the, re the rebate on diesel. Excellent. Okay, um, Alex, from would you like to comment generally on? Yeah, these thank issues? you, Minister. What we're seeing from a local government. Um, perspective in our conversations with industry is that firstly there's a, a, an unmet demand for power in the goldfields as a result of the constraints um, of the 220 kVA line and, and the contracting of power that's existed in the past and we also have a, a growing baseload demand. So the majority of our power is, is baseload and so the challenge there for renewables is, is actually how we solve that solution and drive that price down as, as low as possible. So obviously you if you need to have a, a hybrid system to, to deal with baseload or, or to access the SWIN um, and you've got a price differential between what you can generate solar for and what you can generate um, nighttime power or baseload power for, then that raises the overall price. If we look at then the amount of projects and you know we have 108 operating mines in our economic zone and six, uh, 697 that are either under consideration or possible. What we're seeing and when we talk to miners is, is this funnel effect where a whole number of mines become profitable and, um, and operationable if we get to a price point where they're you know, accessing power at or below 12 and a half cents a kilowatt. So that's the kind of the challenge that we're wanting to do is assist the state and industry um, grow um, for the benefit of everybody. And we are looking, as I said, uh, looking beyond the, uh, we are looking at the uh, behind the meter solutions at this particular point while we're still in, a, in an, un, an unconstrained constrained system. Um, but ultimately the, uh, the idea would be to get those things onto the, um, onto the grid. Uh, now, uh, Craig, would you like to comment? Sure. Uh, thanks, Minister. Um, yeah, look, I think some of the issues have obviously been canvassed. We've obviously helped the government with some work in relation to this issue quite recently. And obviously the network issues, are, I think, are reasonably well understood. They're not necessarily easy to solve and they're a, partly a function of the rules that apply across the network broadly, but partly a function of the technical issues that pertain to Kalgoorlie and the Eastern Goldfields in particular. The second issue that became very apparent during our work was the issue of land tenure. Um, Quite naively, I suspect, I thought, well, there's plenty of land out there, it's flat, there's a lot of sun, surely we can get there. That's quite clearly not the case, and many of you miners are extremely aware of the constraints around the use of that land and the option value of keeping that land for alternative uses, potentially. So that became a second issue that there's just not a lot of freehold land out there that's readily amenable for the use of solar that doesn't have potentially a higher value alternative use. And the third issue goes back to the commerciality issues, and that, that's not really a function of, uh, obviously, Kalgoorlie or... Uh, or the Swiss either. It's a function of just the nature of most mining activity. Um, typically, to make projects work, you need a PPA of at least sort of seven to eight years. Uh, I think many of you will be aware that Snowy Hydro has gone out to tender just recently for 800 megawatts, which is the biggest renewable energy tender in Australia's history by a long margin. Um, they're offering 15-year contracts with ultimately what's a government, Commonwealth Government gap counterparty. Now, I think everyone's aware that miners aren't generally in a position to 
contract for that sort of tenor. They're probably getting more used to the idea, but they, they like to keep their costs more variable, even if at times they might be higher, so that they can reduce their costs when commodity prices are low or when they run into issues around mine life. So that's the other challenge that specific to the mining sector, but that's common to the mining sector across Australia, not just the gold fields. Um, it's less of a problem, obviously, amongst the, the big miners uh, who've got more certainty of mine life and, and, and production profiles, but certainly in some mining sectors, that creates a challenge that both the mining industry now has to get better at and also the finance and the banking industry in particular has to get its head around. Yeah, just um, on that, uh, uh, that part of the work that De Deep Heard and our energy team uh, is doing in the, in the Eastern Goldfields is looking at that la land tenure issue and working to identify uh, those areas, for example, that are currently in pastoral leases that uh, could be uh, appropriate uh, lands held by uh, native, uh, native title holders. Uh, so that's um, part of the work that government can do and uh, we are doing through that team to identify uh, just where um, we may um, be able to, that where we can um, uh, free up land or ensure that the land tenure arrangements are there uh, to allow those um, those facilities um, to be built, whether they're um, solar thermal or, uh, or photovoltaic. They'll need large areas of land and uh, we think that can be, um, can be dealt with reasonably readily. Can I just make a point on, I know we're talking about mines here, but let's not forget that there are also large communities that miners rely on um, and operate in, even in the Pilbara. And so there's a social element to the network I'd like to perhaps point out that we don't often talk about, and that is that not everyone will necessarily be able to afford the off-grid uh, residential solution. So the network does provide, you know, as an economist, the network provides uh, scale and network benefits that are measurable, and it also provides potentially for um, looking after those that are perhaps not able to um, participate in this amazing technology. So we're not, we shouldn't uh, ignore that and the communities that we operate in as well as one of the benefits for a, a network. Oh, that, that's right. And also to uh, increase, and I think this is an important point I was trying to make in the Pilbara, but it certainly applies equally in Kalgoorlie. Um, you know, part of uh, the attractiveness of a place is uh, the diversity, that diversity, the diversity of opportunity uh, can, um, you know, is affected by, uh, by power prices, both in terms of people wanting to come and live there, but also businesses to be able to prosper. So, you know, if you've got stronger regional economies, uh, that is going to help your, um, your mining community, it's going to help your, uh, your social license. One of the smaller projects that we are doing in the gold fields is we're uh, putting together the case for a, a virtual power plant. Uh, so, look, we're, we're very conscious that uh, solar operated individualistically on rooftops uh, might not necessarily be the thing that uh, is the, the best friend of a grid. Um, but we believe that we're looking at um, uh, developing on work that's been done in South Australia where we can uh, do a, a sort of a, a mass uh, rooftop solar where all of those that rooftop solar is um, operated, um, operated centrally, that there's a software that connects up the... Uh, uh, connects up that operation. Now, ideally, we would like a standalone um, battery generation for that with some complex peer-to-peer -peer trading, but we're probably not at that point yet. Um, but we are. We, we would be making this um, operational with small individual battery loading. But um, so that uh, part of that will take some of the space off the uh, off the line that's currently been consumed. Um, while we're waiting uh, to move beyond uh, to the 2022. I understand, Peter, on the grid too, that you are, uh, as you say, there's a lot of unused energy, there's people bought capacity just in case, uh, and that you've done a lot of work to reduce that uh, jet just in case. You've been like the Indian Airlines, you've been really happy to double book everyone. Yeah. Um, uh, so can you just perhaps tell us a bit about that? A little that? bit more about that. Yeah, we, we call it uh, Project Promeneo because every thing in Western Power has to either have an acronym or a you know, really awesome 
project name. So, um, look, it's funny because um, people people often think that networks uh, hate renewables, but it's like, no, we don't hate renewables. We, we would love the network just to be used full time. So, you know, whatever electrons, whatever electricity is used is is great and increasingly I think everyone realises that that's majority going to be a renewable future. So, um, so the interim challenge, while we're trying to pay for this uh, amazing piece of kit for you know our owner, uh, is how do you maximise that? And so, yeah, one of the ways um, Project Promenade is talking to miners, and if there are any of you here that would like to come and see our team, um, quite often um, with a little bit of smarts, with a little bit of renewable storage or battery storage, um, it may be that um, we can provide you with a load that is uh, reliable for all but say two, two uh, or three hours a year and you might have to turn down for two or three hours a year. Um, it's just there's a really long or sh sort of sharp tail on a couple of days where the demand is very high. It's usually hot or there's some lightning strikes in the region or but it, you know Mines can pretty easily deal with that, I would argue, and um, working with our operations team, with our planning team, we feel like we can get uh, you reliable, as reliable, effect, you know, as effectively full, you know, 365 day con um, full power, you effectively get that, um, just on a contingent basis. So if you're prepared to work with us, we'll be prepared to work with you. And I look, I guess the other thing I'd say about, so, Large-scale renewable, I've, I think there's going to be a mix of solutions. There, yeah, there will be some off-grid stuff, absolutely. We, we don't uh, kid ourselves on that. We also don't... Um, but I, I guess we do see a big future for large-scale, utility-scale renewable um, just to reduce the cost of power. And, you know, the, the marginal sent-out price of a, of a large wind farm or a solar farm is, is really low now. In fact... Effectively, in some cases, it's overnight load. It's free with wind sometimes. Um, so by considering the grid in your plans, you also avoid overcapitalizing on your plant. And so I'll just throw that one out there for you. You don't have to overbuild uh, your renewable solution or your diesel plant or whatever. So there, yeah. Anyway, no. long-winded long way of saying, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to do tweaks and new ways uh, of approaching the grid. Uh, any, um, Craig, have you got any comment about what uh, costs, what do you see putting these renewables in the mix, how that can drive down costs for miners, given that's what we're talking about here? Sure. So, um, um, so we're regularly involved in corporate PPA processes. In fact, I counted just before I came into this room that we're currently involved in five such processes in the eastern states. One of them involves a miner slash manufacturer. The other four are in other sectors. But certainly those processes where there's a corporate rated counterparty, I think we've all seen the cost curves drop dramatically over the last two years and you're now getting prices, bundled prices in sometimes below $50 a megawatt hour um, for solar in some regions. Again, which is the price is sometimes subject to the quality of the offtake and the length of the offtake, but those prices have come down dramatically even in the last two years. In, in the NEM, uh, but I mean Queensland's a good example where solar is. What about here? Uh, here, I've, I've less visibility over any corporate PPAs that have been struck in WA. I have to say, and obviously the market's slightly different here. Um, but I would, there's no reason why the solar price would be significantly different, um, and or for that matter, wind in the appropriate region. I think the issues here that are holding up are, are, are independent of cost. In fact, largely, I'd argue, sorry, I'd argue that the capacity. Uh, mechanism in WA, which the NEM doesn't have, would make uh, the price potentially lower in WA because you get an additional income stream for your project. Yeah, there's a, a and more certainty over that stream. Um, so that, I think that's exactly right. Yep. Now, can I, oh, Mike? Did you? Oh, I was oh. just going to say, what are the? Turn it on, man. Am I off? Okay. Well, I mean, one of the biggest impacts on cost is cost of capital, though, which is often kind of forgotten in all of this. And 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 Craig, you sort of got you, you mentioned that. Uh, sort of indirectly by talking about the quality of the off-taker, the term of the off-taker. Uh, the other thing we haven't had in WA is scale of renewable energy projects, which is what's really driving costs down in, on, on the NEM at the moment as well. 
you know, we, I think the biggest solar farm at the moment is, is probably 40 meg being built at the moment by, um, I just talked to the RCR guys before, 37 meg. Um, in, whereas we're building 200 megawatt solar farms on the East Coast. So scale is going to have a big impact on that as well, uh, as well as term and, and, and offtake length as well. Excellent. Look, is there any questions or comments from... Yes, I see a person up there that's clearly keen to participate. Thank you, Minister. Wayne Trumbull, Newmont Power. Um, I guess my question is for Peter. Um, the, I, I'd love to get two or three hours a year where that line didn't go down on us. Um, if, if we can cut that deal, you and I are going to be in shape. Um, recently, the West Kalgoorlie turbines were identified for retirement as part of the retirement package by um, Synergy. They were the support for the 220 kV line in the Cal area. There was an RFP come to the market for replacement of that service. That RFP has been withdrawn from the market by Western Power. Um, my question, obviously, is, Peter, how are you going to maintain the security of supply or supply security, as I heard it described this morning, in that area without some form of network control services uh, directly in Cal? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Wayne. And, uh, you know, without tipping you in it, I believe um, we have been talking to your group about... Um, uh, contingent load. So anyway, um, the yeah, you make you make a good point. Uh, look, short answer is we've got this. Long answer is that our regulators have asked us to go away, and um, there are two services uh, under the current regs that you can um, reliably um, pay for this service, this backup service. So one used to be known as a dispatch dispatch support service. One's known as the network control service. Uh, one of the odd things about the half-pregnant move to the NEM is that we have one little hangover uh, of the NEM. Uh, one, we have uh, the market controlled by EMO, the network uh, effectively controlled by Western Power. So the question of who owns that backup service is, is at play, um, ultimately, uh, the regulators are going to decree uh, a service, and we will. Uh, one of us will uh, will procure that service. So um, we have contingency in place for you know 18 months, and then we will formally uh, contract for a service in the longer term. So, so Peter, during that contingency, Western Power or who who's continuing to provide that? Yeah, so service? it's effectively it's synergy at the moment, and it's. It's a it's a backup power plant. Really, it's just it's 43 megawatts to um, support the town during an outage. Um, it, that will still be there. No one's going to notice anything different. I guess I should be clear. It's all good. Um, all we're talking about is who dispatches or who orders that power plant to turn on. Uh, in the old world, where Western Power controlled both the market dispatch and the network, you know, uh, operation. It would have been us. Um, now that we have these two bodies, sort of half formed, if you like, AEMO is operating the market or the dispatch. There's a debate about who gets to dispatch that power. So anyway, it will be resolved. The power plant is still there. It's going to get an upgrade probably, or someone else will provide the longer term power for us. But yeah, all good. Okay, Alex, did you have a comment on that? Has that been crossed your um, path as an issue? No, really, probably just to point out probably where local government's working to kind of um, assist and play a role in this space. So we're, we're working to not only enable and facilitate renewable energy, and, and that's partly um, been through our collaboration with uh, Minister McTiernan's office and Minister Bill Johnson's office, where um, in nine months we've managed to unencumber a lot, establish a lease over that with the state government, and then sublease that to, to Neo Metals to bring um, you know, new industry to the gold fields, and we're in discussions with other parties to do that. So the power of actually making land available shouldn't be underestimated um, in the right places next to the right assets and how we can work together on that. And um, it, it really does show, in my view, since the change of government, a, a really refreshed 
new approach to, to tackling issues uh, that have come at no cost and have moved at the speed of business. And that's probably a very, very important focus for us as a local government to recognise that investment decisions are made in probably a, you know, a one to three year or window period in, in most instances, certainly in the mining industry in the eastern gold fields. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that we, um, we act in, in that space. Um, we're collaborating on a number of different fronts. So the, if we talk about the virtual power plant that the minister's announced that the city's looking at options how we might ask the government to consider expanding that and working with us to expand that to include private residences and, and business and how we might involve um, the corporate sector uh, in, that, in that discussion. We're looking at participating in behind the meta solutions ourselves as a local government with our contestable sites as a, as a significant energy user in, in the state. We're looking at how we can facilitate discussions around um, a, moving to a, um, a constrained market in 2022 and what that means and what we need to do uh, with the state government and others to work towards being ready uh, for that marketplace. And when we position, say for example, um, solar installations behind the meter, putting them in a place and establishing them in a manner that they may then be able to manage or mitigate risk with the potential to connect to a to a, um, a constrained marketplace in 2022. Um, we're then also looking at, which people have talked about, again, assisting the, the state government in their fantastic announcement to work on establishing very large parcels of land within the gold fields, which traditionally have been very difficult to, to unconstrain, to make available for, for things like solar thermal, which if we then got down to a, a price point of around five cents a kilowatt hour would just have a transformational effect on the amount of um, amount of mining and amount of industry that's that's happening in the gold fields, and then, then probably the last tier that we're we're working in is around again it's in partnership with the state government and, and um, some initiatives they've announced is around working with the state government, CSEO and CSIRO, um, the Wasm um, School of Mines and TAFE around how we can actually develop a centre of excellence and expertise and knowledge in research around energy, uh, batteries and, and lithium. So it's a pretty exciting space, I think, you know, Kalgoorlie and the Eastern Goldfields at the moment. And, and I haven't seen in the time that I've been in local government, which is about 16 years, um, this level of cooperation, I think, between uh, different stakeholders uh, ever. Uh, and, and yeah, I personally find it very exciting. Can I? Excuse Sorry, I might add. Thank you, Alex. If this comes on, sorry. I might add on that. This kind of, maybe what you're picking up partly in the background here is that the industry, the energy industry is changing so quickly that in part regulations are struggling to, you know, catch up. So it's through um, government action to free that up can actually um, really help. And I think we almost here on the couch represent uh, a great example of that. So you the Mungari Industrial Estate in Kalgoorlie has been long talked about as uh, one expansion. I know Carnegie's doing some work on a large scale uh, solar um, project. That goes to land uh, access, that goes to even access to the grid. Now, um, ironically, the constraint on the main line, um, just because of the bizarre way the regulations work on our 220 kV line to Kalgoorlie, they have a spillover domino effect if you want to build a large, effectively industrial scale microgrid like Carnegie's pro proposing for Mungari. So even though they only want a small interchange between the main network and their kind of long you know, line to Mungari, which could also then help develop processing plants, etc., the regulations prevent us from effectively connecting that line. It has to go into the big funnel of competing uh, access offers for, for that capacity. So even just a change to that sort of process, which we're working through with the state government, will help unlock you know, some amazing projects. Yeah. Excellent. Is there any other question from the floor, Seth? I just want to uh, I just want to thank you, Minister McTiernan, because I'm afraid you've got to go back to Parliament now. So we'll carry on. No, no, that's all right. I'm okay. happy to take. Okay. Looking at my watch, this. Thank you, Minister. I have this question for this panel, and I'm going to go specific. What I've heard is a general discussion, which sounds very nice, but in specific, I wanted to build a hundred megawatt power plant, solar plant at Three Springs. 80 meters from the substation. 
It's been four years working with Western powers. They tell me at 3.30 KB line, no constraint. And now they say, I won't get a grid connection till 2020. Now my question is, you said that you want power less than 8 cents. Today I could generate solar at 4 cents. You want technology. We have the latest technology. So you want us to go to the mining, where we can go straight even without batteries to the grid, without interruption, by using biometrics, which will go to one hundredth of a microsecond. Now the question I have is, Western Power says they need one billion dollar funding to do the asset building of the transmission, but there's no load. There are two ways. Either you create a demand or privatized. Then we, I had gone to Western Power said, I would get you the funding, build the line. I mean, the question comes, we investors, how long do you think investor is going to wait for 2020 to get a grid un constant access? Okay. Um, I, I will put that to Peter. I just will comment that those prices I was talking about are at the Pilbara and obviously the prices uh, for an integrated um, system rather than just one, um, uh, you know, because I think we do know that solar standalone, you know, it does need to be part of a grid so that we've got some ability to create that reliability. P Peter, can you just comment yeah, on? Uh, sure. I couldn't possibly comment on privatisation of uh, Western Power. I think the uh, government, uh, you know, has made it clear where they, they stand on that. So I'm speaking purely on uh, the connections policy. And yeah, look, it's a, it's a challenge. We have this odd, uh, oddly named unconstrained grid uh, which is producing constraints. The industry acknowledges that. We acknowledge that. There are wind farms that are also racing uh, to get onto the grid by 2020 to take advantage of uh, the federal um, subsidies that are on offer at the moment. Um, we've come up with a, a near-term solution. Uh, we, we're dealt the hand we're dealt uh, ultimately at the moment. Um, so there are, there are two options. You can build it out, you can build the grid out uh, ad infinitum. That's an inefficient way to run a network uh, and that's accepted around the world. So you, if you have the money today, you can come to us and say, Western Power, I would like to pay for you, for us, to build out the constraint. But I, unfortunately, I think that will make your project uneconomic. So the better way to deal with it, and it is, I acknowledge it's not perfect, and it's 2020 at least, if not 2022. The better way to deal with it is as a, a constrained grid, not in the constrained physical sense, but constrained in, I've got a big black box, a computer, that dispatches every generator second by second and squeezes the most energy onto the grid. And largely, it squeezes a lot more renewable energy onto the grid. And unfortunately, it's going to take four to five to six years to get there. It'll take legislation. Um, so in the, in, in the interim, we've got what's known as the GIA, which is an interim access arrangement for generators. Uh, and there is a queue process for about a thousand megawatts. We are where we are. Um, I wish I had a magic wand. If you've got a billion dollars and you would like to um, come and see us and uh, spend uh, building out the constraint, we can then we can have a discussion. I know it's not going to be a satisfying <coughs> answer, but um, that's where we are. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe I'll, can Look, I, I'll see you afterwards. Come and come and see me afterwards, and I'll explore that. Um, I don't know the details, but I'm definitely happy to take that away. Can Can I just say this? On look, we recognise that there has been a problem with the utilities. I, I personally, I think up to about 2015, uh, a lot of the utilities, like Western Power, had their finger in the dike, hoping that this thing would go away. Um, and uh, this thing of renewable energy would go away. Uh, and, um, and around about that time, I could see, and I think this happened nationally, there was a bit of a, a, a sea change, and, um, a, and it has not been a very long time since then for us to completely revision uh, these systems. So the difficulty is we've got... A, a whole network, we've got a regulatory regime uh, that was developed with uh, for a very different technology and now we've got to try to re-envisage that to incorporate a new technology uh, while keeping the system going and um, 
and uh, and hopefully not seeing the uh, the state go broke um, at the um, at the same time. So we are absolutely, and I think the sort of things, the the changes that Ben uh, Wyatt has announced, both on the Swiss and the Norse, indicate that we are absolutely wanting to change. We would like those to be more uh, to happen more quickly, but we do have to give some regard to our capacity to manage the budget um, and, and the value of those assets that are part of our financial system. So, uh, look, I'm... Yes. Thanks. If, if you could just join me in thanking Minister McTiernan for her keynote and chairing role. So we've still got about eight minutes uh, for questions uh, from the audience. So do we have any questions from the floor? Okay. I had a question for Michael, actually. Um, what do you see as the key next steps in terms of increasing the role of renewables in the eastern gold fields? Uh, I I think um, Peter touched on just earlier the fact that it's going to take a little bit of collaboration between um, local government, uh, the network owner, the energy industry, renewable energy industry, and the landowners as well um, to get some more renewables into the system. And I think there's genuine willingness on behalf of everybody to make that happen. And I think the users, being often mining companies, are open for that as well. They just don't want to pay a premium for that, which is fair enough. Um, maybe one aspect we haven't talked on is, is, although Peter talked about the social aspect and the Minister talked about sort of innovative business models, uh, there's also um, innovative ways to use the local community as well and landowners as well to bring them inside the tent and give them um, not just a seat at the table but perhaps equity in projects as well because my experience with mining companies is they are incredibly innovative on their core business. So in, and I think WA in Australia leads the world in terms of adoption of new mining methods and new processing technologies. But where it's not core, and power generally is considered not core, they just they don't really want to take any risk on that, which is also fair enough. Um, so, so we can bring in different ownership models, different business models around how energy is delivered to mining companies and Eastern Goldfields being one. Um, one of the things that we've done with our Northern Solar project is to bring in uh, Indigenous Business Australia as a co-owner of that project, which um, has been has sort of brought other benefits that we had, didn't really anticipate in terms of just the social acceptance of the project in the community. Uh, the local Indigenous community in particular love the fact that there is Indigenous capital being deployed in, in, that, in the Northern Solar Farm. And that that's, has potential uh, application right across the state. Eastern Goldfields would be, would be delighted for Indigenous ownership, co-ownership in a Mungari solar farm, for example. Uh, certainly every, if you go off-grid now, every Indigenous community in the state should be running on a renewable-based microgrid. It's just crazy that it's still running on diesel. And again, a lot of the barriers are, are really regulatory ones, not, certainly not technology and not cost anymore as well. So I think, again, that's, they're hard hard to get through because it takes time to, to work through what is often a regulatory issue. Um, but there's, if there's real willingness, and, uh, and I think there is, then there's, um, there's a great opportunity to increase renewable penetration and deliver you know, cheaper, cleaner and more reliable outcomes. Okay. Any questions? I, I have one more question and then we'll wrap up. Last year we had, I think, one of our best case studies was a behind the meter utility scale solar project for sun metals. And I wondered if the panel could comment, sorry, Peter, about the possibility of utility scale behind the meter projects in the eastern gold fields for some of the mines there. Yeah. Um I'm not sure whether that's a, an oxymoron or not, but um, uh, utility scale, when we, we look at it, uh, we talk, um, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 megawatts and, and up. Um, so, yes, look, any, you know, anything is possible f uh, if you want to pay that. I guess our, um, our and, and maybe, maybe it's to Michael's point, maybe miners um, don't mind spending more to get an off-grid solution, but I guess we would say that um, the really large scale that will deliver 
genuine uh, reductions in prices uh, will be grid connected. We're talking, you know, 100, 200 megawatts. Now, if you were to put that behind a metre, unless you're Olympic da Dam, I'm not sure that there'd be too many mines that would need that yeah, sort of I scale. I think um, scale is, as I said before, scale is a bit of a challenge because there's no one in WA on the grid that's capable of writing a PPA for 100 megawatts or more that I'm aware of and, and able to do that at the moment. The, the only one possibly would have been Synergy, yeah. but Synergy are now building their own supply to service their, their needs as well. So that was arguably a missed opportunity, perhaps. Certainly, I think Synergy went with what they felt was the lowest cost solution for them. Um, but, uh, I think you know, still behind the metre, I mean, we're so far from that in some ways at the moment. I know, um, uh, you know, you look at a mine like um, Northern Star's Kundana that's got... Uh, 18 megawatts of behind the metre diesel that they just built. You know, that's that's where we're at at the moment in WA uh, and in the eastern gold fields as well. So uh, certainly I think it, it, there, there's, there's a whole world of regulatory challenges we need to deal with and everyone's aware of those and they're working through those and that will help unlock um, utility scale, even if you start utility scale back at 5 or 10 megawatts, that would still be, you know, 5 or 10 megawatts that currently isn't operating in, in the solar space in the gold fields. Yeah, and just from a city, city viewpoint... Uh, not sure whether that's, yeah, it's on. Um, we've got a number of parcels that we have, I guess, unencumbered, some completely, some partially, that are near existing loads. So from a you know, from a behind-the-meter solution or from a, a, a constrained market solution, you know, those are, are available now and in our prospectus for, for companies and investors to, to look at. We probably see, you know, participating in that discussion now around what the constrained environment might look like and the ability if people build behind the meta solutions now for them to, in 2020 or 2022, to actually then become connected and, and how that might be de-risked. And then around portability, so that was raised, I think, in one of the presentations earlier this morning, but that modular uh, portable design, which means assets can be moved and, and relocated if need be, I think that's kind of an essential, an essential consideration. And the last point, um, I'd like to see more work done um, by the city, um, Western Power Industry and others around having the major infrastructure follow the geography, or, or sorry, geology, so that we actually, you know, I've sat down a number of times now with DMP and, and we've kind of, you know, looked at ground which is not, not currently being mined but it's highly prospective and, you know, if you're going to put new assets in then may run the main lines along that, that geology um, and, and, you know, um, uh, without doubt in my mind that'll be mined.